This meeting is being live streamed, gentlemen. It's Value After Hours. I'm Tobias Carlyle, joined as always by Jake Taylor. Special guest today, the great and powerful Christopher Bloomstrand. How are you, sir? I'm well. I'm well, how are you guys? The great Better and powerful. Better for seeing you. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. The, the wizard of St. Louis. Oh, Lordy, stop. Um. <laughs> We've been we've been sort of debating the uh, the status of the American economy and the stock market pretty comprehensively over the last three years, four years since we launched the podcast, but particularly with like increasing sort of fervor over the recent over the few recent months. I guess it's been a, it's been an incredibly wild ride. But what does it look like, Chris, from your perspective as someone who you launched in two thousand? Is that is that right? You launched in around that date we launched uh at early 99 very end of 98 okay so we're in we're into our 25th year which is hard to believe so you've been investing unusually for many people on um social media and and doing these sort of podcasts you've been investing through uh two sort of cycles that probably look fairly similar what does it look like from your perch how do you how do you see the world i think we've i think we're coming off another secular peak and it's kind of hard to believe that that we've seen as many peaks and troughs in my short lifetime i mean it feels like i'm still a kid um but you had the late 90s bubble which was extraordinary i never thought we'd see the likes of that again the big blue chips the first kind of the second iteration if you will of the nifty 50 peaked in 98 with Coke at 50 times earnings and all the big blue chips, GE was really expensive. And then obviously you, that morphed into the tech bubble. So those blue chips started declining. Berkshire started declining after they bought Genry in 98. But, you know, March 2000 was the mother of kind of all bubble peaks that rivaled 1929, some parallels to 1966. And, you know, you sold off hard, the market dropped in that 2000 to 02 decline by about 50%, fully recovered by 07, and then 08, obviously, great financial crisis. Um, You had a low in the fall of 08, early 09, and really, you know, as I value the market in my entire career, outside of right at the outset, coming off the savings and loan and kind of banking crisis, um, got out of school in 91, stocks were arguably fairly priced at that point. And then you went into that 90s bubble uh, run up and things were extremely expensive. You really were not cheap by 02 on three years back to back. Market was down 9, 11, and then 22%. Value guys made money. We made a bunch of money during those three years, which we wouldn't have expected to do, but the market was extremely bifurcated. But really in 08, 09 on the decline that took the S&P back down from having retraced back up to 1500, back down to 666 at the low. Yeah, you really did have genuine yeah. undervaluation um, during that period. And there was a fear that we were going to repeat the Great Depression and the, the S&P would fall another 300 points, um, which obviously didn't happen. And then we you know, ran back up again. And you, know, you had a series of years here where the S&P, this last 10 years leading up to the end of 2021, was extraordinary. It looked a lot like the 90s. It looked a lot like the 1920s. And I know you guys see, saw my letter last year. I had a piece in it that suggested um, that that you were at a secular peak, that with stocks trading on record margin of what was then 13.3%, trading at tw- almost 23 times earnings, that was a secular peak. And across all the metrics, you'd you know run as parallels, price to sales, market cap to GDP, all of which are nuanced. You have to make adjustments for them, but there there was no question that that in my mind was a secular peak. And then, of course, you had an eighteen percent decline last year, and you cleansed some of that excessive valuation. You had the dual hammering thanks to inflation of you took the profit margin down by two hundred basis points from thirteen point three percent for the S and P down to eleven three. So you lost fifteen percent on return to the decline in in the margin, and you took the multiple from. 23-ish down to 19. And so you lost 16 or so percent there. So between those two measures, you're down 30%. What was interesting about the inflationary period that we're in and, and last year and even into this year, I don't know if people would believe it, but 
you had you had sales growth, which had averaged about 4% a year for the prior 20 years. Top line sales ran 12.5%. Uh, yeah. You gained one point from continued sherry purchases, but you were you know 12.8 or 12.9%. You had an absolute outright decline in profitability. Earnings for the S&P were $208 at the end of 21. I don't know what the final count was. I, I had it at 200 in my letter this year probably going to be like 197 or 198. Um, I think those numbers are probably final on S&P's website, but you had an absolute decline in earnings. And you know, if you take the record profitability of energy, which was producing, the energy sector was producing losses in 2020, you know, made up four or 5% of profits in 2021 and made up you know, darn near 15% of profits last year. If you take energy out, Everything else just got hammered. So you saw that with the big techs, the you know the, the five big tech stocks. I call them the Fab Five. They were down thirty six or thirty seven percent. Of course, they're leading the market this year. But you know, you know, we're still from a broad, you know, long winded answer. But broadly speaking, I think we still have an awful lot of excesses to cleanse. Um, the overall market remains expensive. It, it, it you know we're not we're nowhere near what you'd call a secular low. I don't know what that looks like, but we're facing a lot of challenges. The Fed doing its thing with interest rates, you know, they're famous. I mean, famously, every bubble in, in throughout time, they've popped with big interest rate rising cycles. <laughs> yeah. You didn't know who was going to get taken on on a stretcher, but, you know, the the levered, borrow short, lend long crowd um, mm -hmm. gets itself killed when you raise basic interest rates by 500 basis points. Somebody's going to blow themselves up and, you know, how much more of that to come. The Fed thinks it's got to be Paul Volcker. I'm not sure that's right. So a lot of interesting nuances, but at the end of the day, we're stock pickers and you pay attention to everything going on. It, you know, we always find value, but, you know, I, I think we're far from out of the woods and a lot of challenges remain would be my view from 40,000 feet. Do you have any view on uh, the likely trajectory of earnings from here? It's still down, but even before it cracked, there was some pieces there's a piece out of the man group where they thought trough earnings on the S&P 500 was if you just for if you took what had occurred in various other recessions and applied that to where earnings stood at that time and this article was probably early 22 or possibly even late 21 they thought trough earnings were in the order of $185 or $186 which seemed uh, a long way down from where they wrote it and that was very much an outlier at the time do you think that how do you feel about that number is that reasonable or is it too low too high i mean if we were on an operating earnings basis which is before write-offs and write-downs if you were 198 or whatever 197 last year you were probably there on a reported earnings basis already for the past mm -hmm. year um I mean, you tell me how inflation evolves over the next 10 years and i'll tell you where i think margins yeah. are headed if if you have a period like the 70s of rolling inflation the burns fed is argued today to have been behind the curve and they let inflation run too hot. Well, I've got a piece in this year's letter that suggests otherwise. You know, they had they they propped the funds rate in advance of the CPI, which was the metric at the time. It wasn't the PCE, but they're very correlated anyway. Um, you had this series of rolling periods of rising and falling inflation. The Fed was ahead of the curve. Um, you know, they credit Volcker with coming in at the end and, and hiking rates to 19 and change. But inflation was already in retreat when he did it. I think people forget that the Volcker Fed then cut rates to eight and three quarter percent after the first recession and then hiked them straight back up to 19, which was pretty extraordinary. And I think if if inflation is out of the bag and some of this will prove permanent, you're not going to get wages back. Um, mm -hmm. you know, Sticky. The pri price level, some of this is durably. Uh, higher, whether that means incrementally on a year over year basis, you're going to continue to get inflation or not, I don't know. But if you do have inflation, and I think that could be the salve for the debt bubble that we have, you know, you can't, you just can't operate a system with 350% on balance sheet credit market debt to GDP. And I kind of hypothesize if, if, if we run inflation at an average of four or five or 6%, which you can do for a decade or two decades, um, you're going to see materially lower earnings. You know, not all businesses can pass through. I mean, you've got top line growth last year, obviously, which was companies passing through their rising cost of goods sold and labor costs and what have you. But 
but volumes on when you li- read transcripts were like, hey, we got uh, 11% on price, uh, but we lost 3% on volume. <laughs> yeah. You look at it in car loadings at, 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 Ber- at Berkshire's BNSF, you look at the Union Pacific, you look at really industrial America. You know, our, our second biggest holding is Commodity Chemical Company, headquartered here in St. Louis, Olin. Their volumes are absolutely in the tank. I mean, they're in they're in the deepest recession. These guys running the business have seen in their careers, and you know we're far from, you know, what would be prescribed as these back to back quarters of genuine recession. But things under the hood are far weaker, I think, than conventionally believed. Yeah, you're exactly right on volumes. Things are very very weak. I think there, as much as there are problems with things like the Schiller P, I I like that. I I use the Schiller P just as sort of a shorthand for. You know, you can get the same answer if you go and look at Tobin's Q, but I just find it's much harder to calculate from publicly available information or uh, Buffett's measure, the market mu- cap total, GDP. total market cap to GNP. It's GNP, but GDP and GNP are in practical terms are virtually identical. They give you exact, all of them give you the same answer. They say that we've been in this massively expensive period of time that started somewhere around 1996 and we've had periods of time where we've sort of gone back to maybe like long run average Schiller PE as in this instance. And so 2009, we got back to the long run average there. We didn't dip much below it for very long. Since then, we've sort of been very, very expensive. Is that is that something that, is there just some change in the way that we invest? Everybody's become aware of the fact that equities are a little bit safer than perhaps they were in the past. I don't know. Or that that you know, a lot of these stocks end up being bond proxies and they, they just sort of trade on some small um, premium or discount to the 10-year. I think, I mean, you have margin are really high. You have rates got really low. Um, you have ROEs Stretch being multiples. kind of, yeah, ridiculous, like seemingly unsustainable. You got tax, effective tax rate way low for corporate America. So it's like every not lever you could pull has kind of been pulled in one direction, it seems like. Would you agree with that, Chris? Yeah, you go back to Warren Buffett's Fortune article and interview, I think in 99, maybe or 98, kind of leading up to that bubble. Yeah. Um, and, he, and he used the market cap to GDP as a proxy and suggested that profit margins were mean reverting and range bound. Well, he couldn't have been more wrong. Yeah, on that front, because you didn't see some of these the, the reduction in the tax rate, you didn't see the capital light aspect of some of these mm-hmm. tech companies that sit at, at top of the market today. So you had to adjust the profit margin materially higher than where it had been historically. I think you got to eight point nine percent nineteen twenty nine, which was a real outlier. But then you were range bound between kind of four and seven percent for a long time. You got it up to seven and a half percent in two thousand, rolled back over, but. You know, seeing a 13.3% profit margin Jesus. in uh, 2021 took, you know, all of these stars aligning. All of those long-term series like the market cap to GDP, price to sales, uh, you know, the Tobin's Q, you've got to adjust for this profitability. So there are two main adjustments you've got to make to the market cap to GDP. One, in 1929, when you were 90% or whatever and kind of nosebleed, you had to assess how much of uh, GDP and how much of aggregate corporate profits was attributed to publicly traded companies versus private. Well, you had a hell of a lot more private enterprise and even an agrarian society then than you do today. And the other aspect you've got to adjust for is the degree to which we trade globally. I mean, you if your GDP in 1929 was 103 billion and it f- fell to $54 billion, trade in 1929 was, you know, we were a net exporter to the tune of a billion dollars and it was 5 billion against 4 billion. So you're, you know, kind of four to 5% of GDP trade is a much larger component today. And so profits for the S&P 500 are now half produced abroad and half produced domestically. So all of those trend lines that you would look at have to be adjusted upward, but you know, you were stretched by any, by, by any stretch of the imagination. Um, a year ago, and you're still you still remain stretched. And I think you know, whether it's Schiller's PE or all of them, you know, you're still nowhere near a secular low. And so, again, kind of back to how we delever this economy, whether it's via inflation or whether it's a really deep recession, 
where you write off a whole bunch of bad assets, which is kind of the classic Austrian school way you should do it, but we're we so far anyway. beyond the ability to do it. You can't <laughs> do it that way. And maybe you get hyperinflation. So there are a lot of, there are a lot of tales to how badly this thing can go. And I think, you know, if they just go and we list along and you run 350% debt to GDP and run that down to 300 or 250%, you can do that over 20 years, but it's going to be a pretty brutal period for the passive investor in stocks, brutal period for the, for the, the owner of credit. I don't understand why anybody in their right mind would have owned a bond a year ago when interest rates were low or why you would have owned a mortgage. I mean, you know, people are learning a lot about duration and convexity risk now. Yeah, but, yeah. they you know, really you're are. Paid, you're getting paid nothing to take an enormous amount of risk and then you layer on a bunch of leverage on top of it like we do in our classic finance systems and you know, people are going to get thesis, taken out on a stretcher. The yeah. thesis was something like the U.S. had positive interest rates. The, the U.S. had um, low but positive interest rates, whereas some enormous, I don't know what it ended up being at the absolute peak, but 20% plus. 17 trillion, world. I think, something like that, of negative yielding debt. And it, it just seemed like that was the trend. That was the trend forever that we would, that, and I, don't, I, th I think you still find people who think that we're going at some point to negative rates, even in the US. I guess that's the that's, reason why. Well, people were buying bonds for capital appreciation, not for yield. And that's a very always a very dangerous game to play, no matter what you're doing. If you went back 20, 30 years ago, when you had a normal yield curve, five or six on the short end, seven or eight on the long end, forget about the high interest rates of the late 70s and early 80s, but you know, just running kind of five to seven. Well, you can't run five to seven, but there you could you could have a credit component to an investment portfolio. Yeah. How in the world? You know, your chief investment officers of big pension systems and university endowments could justify credit at all in the allocation. You know, the problem with the bond is you get paid three percent. You've got to reinvest the you got to reinvest the coupon, but you're going to get only your principal back at maturity, regardless of what the inflation rate is. You know, if you own real estate, at least over time, you've had appreciation of the underlying asset. You own common stocks, and you receive a portion of your return as dividends. You reinvest those dividends at what I like to think of as a control premium. You're paying the current multiple to earnings for whatever businesses you're buying. But any portion of reinvested capital in theory is being reinvested, you know, intelligently one, one time at, price at a mid-teens right. return. Now, if it's all chewed up, like it happens with broadly for the S&P, where you get 35 or 40% in dividends and the balance of two-thirds of your profit all goes to share purchases at 20 <laughs> times earnings and 5% earnings yield. That's not a great use of capital, but I mean, that beats the hell out of a credit instrument where you simply get your 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 principal back at maturity. That's just an insane way to allocate capital and take duration and convexity risk on top of it when rates were so low and negative in parts of the world. Speaking of Silicon Valley Bank, give us your, <laughs> oh, give us your take on <laughs> On uh, Silicon Valley Bank. What, what about it? Oh, just do you have a view on it? What, what's your take? You know, it, I don't. Is my understanding is you don't even have a credit problem yet. I mean, this is just simply banking, right. banking with unmitigated, you know, assumption of duration risk in your fixed income portfolio, and you know, not a big enough bank to be systemically important. And so, you know, if if you get four or five of these, you get more big banks go out. You're going to get the entire backstop of deposits. You saw our Treasury Secretary walk that back last week, um, but you'll you'll eventually get the, which, the full which guarantee one, of deposits. How did she end up? Which way did she end up? I saw <laughs> I saw her go a few different directions. She had an each way bet. I thought uh, you're going to have to have a lot more pain before you see the full um, the full force of the federal government, and the Federal Reserve um, backstopping. But you know, it took in 08 the financial crisis. The suspension of mark-to-market -market accounting. Um, you could take the portion of a bank's bond portfolio that's available for sell or held to maturity, and you know if you run the entire book on a mark-to-market -market basis, which you don't have to do in bank accounting, you, you do have these these permanently held bond portfolios that you intend to hold to maturity. But if you mark everything to market, you got a whole bunch of banks that have no tangible equity capital anymore, and you know. Is You're an bad? investor in a bank. I mean, you know, you can see in the Berkshire portfolio, 
over the last couple of years. I mean, even though B of A is still a big position, but I mean, they materially gutted the majority of the, 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 the bank portion of the stock portfolio. And I've got to believe that's an understanding of, you know, your, your spread business when you're starting at very low absolute yields can be toxic. You know, banking is just classic. You've got the left side and the right side of the balance sheet. Well, the asset side of the balance sheet is totally unknown. The liability side, you know, with precision who you owe and when you have to pay it to. But the asset side is very assumption based and is the outside investor. You don't really get a good look at what a loan book looks like, what the assets look like, but you do know. Um, I mean, you can read on the portion, you read your 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 um footnote and marking all those assets to market, you can see where the exposure was on a quarterly basis in the Q filings and in the K filings. Just way too much risk assumed for um, a modicum of return. Let me let me just do a few shout outs because we I always like to let everybody know where everybody's dialed in from. <laughs> um, we got Dubai, Montreal. Bonjour from Montreal. Hello. Mm -hmm. Bluestone Lane, Manhattan Beach. Oh. Nice. Dubai, Loma Linda, California, Tallahassee, Norberg, Sweden, London, Seattle, Washington, Saskatchewan. And I have to give me a guide on how to say that. Zurich, Brandon, Tampa. What's up? Should we uh, transition to a, some, do a little veggie segment? In, let's, do some, uh, let's do some veggies. All right. Are you so familiar this, with the veggie segment, Chris? You know, uh, whenever you're having this, a, an this is where I, like I get really pedantic for about ten minutes, and then uh, <laughs> then we go back to the regular show. You have to eat your veggies when you're having a when you're having your meat and potatoes and your dessert. You got to eat your veggies. You got to eat the healthy portion of the meal. Well, all I've got is coffee. It'll, it'll have to do. <laughs> That'll work. Um, so. You know, this is uh, we're going to be talking about bamboo blooms, and I figured that's a nice little segue since we have a bloom strand on the show. Um, and this actually comes from uh, Toby and I were in Palm Springs this last weekend together with some other friends and uh, had a very fun and restorative session there. Got some sunshine. But uh, one of our friends told us this story about these bamboo blooms that turn into human catastrophe. And so I'm going to tell you the backstory of it. Like I went and did a little bit more research and, uh, and we'll see what we can pull from this. So it's 1959 in Northeast India and humans are desperately seeking food as this famine is stalking the countryside. Mothers are digging up roots to fill their little children's bellies. Some are hiking hundreds of miles just to find a little bit of rice for their starving children and thousands of people end up dying of starvation. Uh, and it's, you know, it's a natural disaster, but it wasn't brought on by wind or drought or flood. It came on four legs in the millions and it's a plague of rats. And what hap what's happened is, is, is specifically it's this dreaded black rat, which is which actually is the rat that carried the plague throughout uh, medieval Europe. And it turns out these black rats are rapid breeders and their gestation period is only 21 days. The pups are weaned within two weeks after that. And they're these very opportunistic omnivores that will eat almost anything in sight. Uh, what is weird about this is that 48 years later, in 2007, a similar plague sweeps through northeastern India. And the farmers expected to harvest about 4,000 pounds of rice that year, and they ended up getting 50. Uh, and oddly enough, these rat plagues have been happening at a 40 year, 48 year cadence with documented, documented cases back to 1911, 1863. And uh, what we've talked a little bit about plagues before on the show. And what an interesting fact is that often they end up being a prime number, like 13 or 17 years apart. And the reason for that is that another, if there was another organism that was trying to like time it to get on with them, um, like you don't want to be on a, a repeating number, like an, you know, an even number necessarily, because it's too easy for the, for the other organism to sync up and then like be a predator on you. So they end up being prime numbers. I don't know why this came in at 48 for, for whatever reason, but um, so this little, little bit more backstory is the, the this area of India is blanketed by 2,400 square miles of bamboo. And every 40, 48 years, these bamboos, the, the bamboo blossoms and it fruits, and then it drops all this fruit and then it dies. And then the next batch grows up. And about six months later from the fruiting, is when this plague 
uh, moves out of the forest and into the fields. So the, it, it ends up being that the, the bamboo produces 10 tons of fruit per acre. Like it's just an absolute deluge of fruit and, and calories that are available. And so the rats, they, they, they get the sensor that like, okay, there's a ton of calories here and they go into crazy overdrive to just crank out more baby rats. Um, so every, over seven, like a, a well-fed female rat can start a cycle that results in nearly 200 offspring. So 50 females can produce within like less than six months, 10,000 rats. So just, you end up keep like pyramiding this, multiplying it up. And as long as the calories there, it's all good. Uh, but only when there's a large enough supply of calories, will their bodies trigger this super fertility. So eventually all of that fruit rots away and the rats who are desperate for calories now descend out of the forest and into the rice fields and they eat everything. And then the humans end up starving. Um, and so the, the first little, like, we'll tie this back to, um, <laughs> this is a little bit of a stretch, but I kind of think of sometimes like, you know, how Charlie runs daily journals portfolio is a little bit like this, where he's just like waiting for an absolute feast of calories to come along and he's doing nothing for long periods of time. And then it dumps and he, you know, pulls over on the side of the road and he puts the whole portfolio into bank of America and whatever it was Fargo or whatever it was. Uh, so he's, he is, uh, very advantageous in that same kind of way and very patient the way that nature is. Uh, that's the, the good side of the analogy. Here's the bad side of the analogy. And this is what our friend was talking about. Is it possible that humans finding and uh, capturing the energy of hydrocarbons is somewhat akin to the fruit dumping on us? And then like we then ramp up our population and then as hydrocarbons get harder and harder to find and then come back down, do, are we looking at perhaps a similar fate of uh, too many rats and not enough energy to go around? And then like, what the hell do we do? Um, and if you look at uh, the, like the size of the oil finds, you know, like they peak in the, in the sixties, if you look at them by decade and it kind of is this ramp up and then it starts to ramp back down, like the, both the number of giant finds and the volume of those giant finds. Uh, and, you know, some people say that we're having to do increasingly heroic things to get hydrocarbons out of the earth uh, for our for our use. So, Chris, as I, I know that you have oil and gas in your portfolio uh, and I, I don't I don't assume and please correct me if you're wrong, if I'm wrong, but that it's like a long term, you know, like 30 year idea for you necessarily. It was more like, God, how stupid cheap can these be? And I have to take advantage of that. But um what do you think about all this? Are we are we the rats in this, it's a, in this I guess analogy? It's a, it's a peak oil type analogy. A little bit, yeah. Well, I'm sitting here worrying about how these rats are going to get from India to St. Louis first and foremost. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they take the yeah they take the boat. Um, you know we have we have policy that's driving us toward um, kind of net zero by 2050. Uh, and the cadence at which you go has created opportunities. You've created some genuine scarcities and things like refining capacity mm. domestically and abroad. We've gone from something like 250 refineries 20 years ago in the United States down to 127 or so. But until four or five years ago, as you would close refining uh, refiners, the residual uh, refineries would continue to add capacity as population growth and industrial demand demand growth um, grew. Well, in the last four or five years, we've actually closed net refining capacity either outright or you take, you know, Holly Frontier, now HF Sinclair, Valero's got some, but you take your Cheyenne refinery, you take your, some of your properties in New Mexico and you convert them to make renewable diesel which is interesting. California is starting to mandate over time the use of only renewable diesel in class eight tractors. Um, fine. But when you convert that refinery, you go from making, um, you know, millions of uh, barrels of output globally to uh, thousands. You're, you're doing it on a much smaller scale. The renewable diesel is a biofuel. It's you take this effectively food cellulose product. Um, you make what's chemically identical to uh, diesel, uh, burns the same, wears on the engine the same, you have the same efficacy. But the problem is you make a smaller amount of it than you would have a conventional refiner that might be doing you know, 30,000 barrels or 300,000 barrels or 800,000 barrels for a bigger one. But out of the stack 
comes nothing anymore. You close your conventional refinery, you don't you don't get jet fuel, you don't get kerosene, you don't get gasoline, all you don't get distance. asphalt, waxes, all of the feedstocks for petrochemicals. And so we have a genuine shortage in the United States of probably a million barrels of refining capacity on kind of 20 million barrels of supply demand. And we're a net importer and exporter, depending on the product. You know, our we have complex refineries that can make the whole stack. We have access to light, sweet crude. We've got to import heavier crude stocks to make some of the heavier components at the bottom of the stack. In any event, we're you know on 20, we're short a million. The globe's probably 3 million barrels short. And we're just not building refining capacity, certainly not in Europe and the United States. So places like that, You've got you know, Berkshire making its big investment in, in in Oxy and in Chevron. You've got a rationality from these businesses. And I think, you know, perhaps when your politicians put a gun to your head and say, we're going to put you out of business, you think twice about overspending. Yeah. CapEx the, gets... the massive overspending that took place from 2011 through 2015. You know, at Chevron and Exxon were spending double the rate at which they're spending CapEx today. So you've got a rationality that, exists in places that has made some of these things interesting. I'm not sure to your point that they're 30 year investment assets, mm-hmm. um, but they could be, I mean, depending on, depending on where we go with public policy, um, they very well could be, but you know, two years ago you had the total energy component of the S and P 500 was down to something like one and a half percent. It had been as high as 12 or 13% 10 years prior. You're kind of back up to 5% or so today, but you know, we're paying one times EBITDA for assets. Um, Holly bought a refinery from Royal Dutch Shell. You know, the European majors had guns to their heads saying divest of, you know, your dirtiest assets. Well, you know, they were dumping refineries. Um, you know, rational buyers wouldn't bid on those in Europe because of the, the, the political lens. And so, you know, Holly pays... 550 million, let's call it 200 of which was finished good inventory, feedstock inventory. So you had probably $350 million is what they paid for the asset that would cost a billion five to replace. Well, that asset had done $250 million in EBITDA on average for the prior five years. So they paid slightly over one times. And I talked to folks in the energy patch who say, you know, and when, when Armstrong and his team operates that asset, they're very good operators. You know, versus the trader that sits there employed by the European major, that asset's going to do another $50 million in cash flow per year above and beyond what it was doing owned by the European major. So, you know, th- those opportunities will continue to come along as we barrel down the path of, um, you know, trending toward carbon neutral. You're going to see displacement in electric vehicles, whether you have the resources available. So, as an investor, you can be opportunistic when things go too far too quickly in, in various directions. So I still treat these cyclicals in the portfolio as, as assets you've got to buy at the right price and then a, which you've got to sell them at the right price. You know, they're, they're nowhere near as cheap as they were. So as I've been adding to things like Dollar General, you know, I've got to put an order in to trim ExxonMobil and trim Valero, for example, simply because I've got you know better opportunities and better assets now that are cheaper and growing versus the cyclicals that really aren't going to grow. But there, there's a rationality for the time being that these guys are minting money. And with these profits that that the politicians want to tax as surplus profit, well, you got to account for the fact that they lost money for a whole bunch of years and the returns on capital sucked. Yeah. If you average kind of the feast and the famine, you kind of get to a mediocre return Normal on capital business, in, yeah. these, in these assets. But they're making so much money Chevron's making so much money. Exxon's making so much money. Oxy's making so much money. Look at the balance sheets. I mean, look yeah. at the degree to which levered over-levered down. balance sheets have been really cleaned up uh, nicely in the last couple of years. And, you know, they're, they're better investments than they would have been over much of the past decade. Yeah. And if you stay down at a reasonable multiple, like Buffett, you know, I'm sure every day he's hoping that Oxy goes down a little bit more and they're buyback strategy that he's holding them, you know, <laughs> accountable to publicly. Do you have any thoughts <laughs> on, on Buffett in Oxy, Chris? Well, I think he likes the management. Um, they've done a great job, Vicky and her team with, with the, um, their assets in the Permian. 
I think there's an angle, perhaps, you know, they're, they've got big investments in carbon capture, which is kind of ridiculous. You know, you'll take, you'll, you'll, you'll take a cement plant, capture the carbon and send it into a, a depleted uh, hole in the ground. Um, but, you know, much like what Berkshire's doing in their solar and their wind and their grid investments, these are regulated investments. You're getting a, you're getting a known rate of return. Uh, taxpayer subsidized the tax rate inside of Berkshire Hathaway energy is negative almost 50 percent um the carbon capture is also coming at, at the at being financed by the taxpayer and if you can lay out a whole bunch of money as I think oxy is starting to demonstrate they can it's a place for it could be a place for Berkshire's capital I mean you know, you're up to 23 or so percent without adjusting for the warrants that they've got you know, they've got the $10 billion preferred paying 8% that's going to start getting whittled down a little bit here. Um, you know, I could see them continue to buy this thing. Uh, and, and that carbon capture kind of aspect of it where, you're, where you've got a tax-subsidized regulated return component um, is probably what interests Berkshire the most. It and seems you... like one of those things he wouldn't want to own outright, though, for the same reason that he maybe didn't buy... Uh an attractively priced cigarette company, but he's willing to hold Walmart that sells cigarettes publicly. Yeah, I don't, I, you know, who knows? I mean, to tender for the rest of the business that Berkshire doesn't own, you'd have to pay a much higher premium than, sure. you know, he's paying in the in the open market today. Yeah, he'll just keep chipping away at it. And if at the end of the day, these are cyclical assets that you don't necessarily want to own for 30 or 40 or 50 years. You know, hell of a lot harder to sell the whole thing if you own it entirely than to you know feed it back out into the marketplace. And if he's happy with what they're doing cap allocation wise, he doesn't need to get in there and kind of fix that. So he pinned their uh, pinned their covers to the mask by putting that slide up and making yeah. it public and talking about that regularly how do you feel about uh berkshire uh the entity can you walk us through how you how you think about it i think about it like it's a bond um, to a degree the predictability of the earning streams which are coming from all the myriad sources you know the profits you get from the energy business from the railroad from their manufacturing service retail and leasing businesses um are very knowable um very durable um, very well capitalized. Uh, and then you've got by far the world's best assembly of uh, insurers on the planet, which are just massively overcapitalized. I've gone through the math with you guys before, um, but you've got 275 or so billion dollars of capital. Geico requires, you can, you can write three bucks of auto premium for every dollar of statutory surplus. Um, you know, they probably get 20 million or $20 billion of capital. Um, the specialty business gets some other 20 billion of capital, the balances and the reinsurers. You just picked up the Allegheny assets, which I think Berkshire just stole. We owned Allegheny, which we bought in the financial crisis or in the, in the pandemic at about half a book. I think it was worth at least 20% more than Berkshire paid. Um, Weston Hicks told me recently that the operating businesses, uh, he he heard they were way more profitable um, for the last year. I mean, they were earning 12 on equity a year ago. Um, not inconceivable that they were into the 20s returns on equity. And so given what Berkshire can do with the Allegheny investment portfolio, flipping it from what was largely bonds to largely yeah. stocks, retaining more business when it's written. I mean, that whole, that whole, and you're picking up $5 billion of premium from TransRe. Uh, of the seven billion of total reinsurance premium that the Allegheny Collective of insurers write, so you know that reinsurance operation at Berkshire, and I've got a chart in this year's letter uh, that shows you how much capital the aggregate of the reinsurance industry has globally. Yeah, Berkshire has more than a third of it, and they write, <laughs> and they write, you know, seven cents on the dollar of capital in premium volume. Well, the Swiss and the Germans, Swiss Re and Munich Re right at about a buck of premium for a buck of capital, which is insane. I mean, the Europeans have never met an insurance an insurance policy they didn't like, an insurance risk, <laughs> and the banking system in Europe never met a loan they didn't want to make. Um, 
And these have been horrible investments for decades. You look at the stock price charts and they're just, just, just dying a slow death over time. Berkshire's so massively capitalized with you know, that reinsurance business, again, writing seven cents on the dollar of statutory capital. You can't kill it. It allows Berkshire to have a largely a, st- a common stock portfolio versus a bond portfolio. So you put it all together and I've got you know 53.9 billion, I think it was this year in total Berkshire earnings. A big slug of that comes from the stock portfolio. You know, you've got the retained earnings, obviously, of the investees that is now running close to $17 billion. You've got five and a half pushing six billion in dividends. If you only assume, and here, here's where my number, you know, some people say, well, Chris, you know, you make these adjustments for you know the railroad and the and the energy business, they use accelerated depreciation. And I presume a a, a timing benefit of you know fully depreciating an asset in year one or year two. That's about a billion dollars. And you know, you can you can kind of pick at that and throw that assumption away. But the big assumption is if Berkshire only earns the earnings yield on the portfolio, which now gets you to you know 17 billion plus five, uh, that's you know, the thing had been a 19 to 20 times earnings for the prior couple of years. Well, with the stock portfolio down last year and with Berkshire investing almost 60 billion dollars net back into the stock portfolio you've got a way bigger earnings number coming and it's trading at a 7% earnings yield. So if the stock portfolio only makes 7% a year between dividends and retained earnings, that's the number that exists in my 53.9 billion. But if the 300 plus billion dollar stock portfolio makes another 3% a year and averages 10%, it's another $10 billion in Starting to earnings talk about real that money effectively <laughs> inures for shareholders benefit that's not counted. So you know, I've got a case in the, I've always assumed kind of a 10 ROE and Berkshire earns a little more than 10. Well, that it's the delta really between the stock portfolio doing better than the earnings yield of the stock portfolio over time. One thing you had in the letter that kind of surprised me was that um, you said that BNSF wasn't going to be uh, somewhere where he could plow, plow capital back in like he had been able to, and that that was sort of closed off, rel- especially relative to, to BH Energy. Can you explain that a little bit? Yeah, when they bought the Burlington Northern in the financial crisis in 09, it closed in 10. They had the opportunity to put more leverage in the business. They paid what a 36 or so billion dollars for it, including the piece they already owned. You, you, you were able to go add corridor track. You were able to blow out all the tunnels in the West yeah. to allow for intermodal, Raising the double higher. stacking. And there was a lot of what you would call capacity improvement of the system that was that was there for the picking, you know, it was ripe for the picking. And so Berkshire was spending in the rail two dollars of CapEx for every dollar of depreciation. Well, normally kind of 120, 130 percent um uh capex would be maintenance capex relative to depreciation. Um, but there was a there was a big delta there where they were able to really improve. Now they didn't add net track miles. The whole thing's been thirty six thousand track miles from the get go, but there were a lot of improvements to the system that allowed for ongoing profitability. So this is a business that earns yeah. kind of low to mid teens returns on capital. That capex has run its course, and so you've now got capex at the rail running a little under one hundred and fifty percent of depreciation for the last couple three years, and so the the, the cadence of that spending has declined. You know, you're not going to you're not going to go from thirty six thousand track miles to forty six thousand to fifty six thousand. There's only so much you can do with the system, but the system is what it is. It'll you know continue to throw off um, you know abundant abundant cash, presuming a lot of profitability. The energy business, on the other hand, where you're adding wind capacity, you're adding solar capacity, you're building the grid. You know, every dollar of profit that's earned by the energy operation since they bought Mid American has been retained and invested. And if you understand accounting and the regulation of regulated utilities, you're going to augment equity capital with a roughly a like amount of debt capital running between 40 and 60%. If you're 40% kind of debt, the regulators think you're not spending enough on maintenance. If you're running 60%, you're gorging on leverage. So you tend to kind of run half and half, but they're retaining $4 billion. Yeah, no the, dividends. The 5 billion, would you consider the the the, the joint venture pieces um, that Berkshire doesn't own 100% of? Uh, 
and augmenting it with debt. So you're running you're running CapEx and, and for the duration of their ownership, retaining all that money and spending $2 of CapEx for every dollar of depreciation. And that's genuine growth CapEx. It's a great use of about $5 billion of retained capital every year. The railroad, since they bought it, has dividended up almost all of its profits. I think all of its profits to the parent company for use elsewhere. There's just, there's only so much capital that the rail could take, but Berkshire's appetite for their energy assets is is endless for the time being, and it's heavily subsidized by the taxpayer. And so, you know, that energy piece is going to be bigger than the railroad within a couple, three years, and will continue to grow. It's, you know, by far going to be the second most important asset to Berkshire next to the insurance operation. Do you think that, um, I have a kind of a secret hypothesis that the the BH Energy represents this awesome kind of capital allocation training wheels for the next guy who comes in because he can always stick it in there and earn a 10% ROE, let's call it. Whereas, you know, if he has to be real clever about, you know, buying a, uh, let's say like Scott Fetzer uh, and like, okay, that you don't keep any money in there. That money's coming out. It has to be redeployed. The decision is so easy to just stick it into BHE if you don't have another opportunity set that's obvious. Yeah, I've got I've got a table in the letter, and I took the last five years of cash flow from operations, and which totaled about one hundred ninety billion dollars, I think, for five years, and then backed off depreciation, which is another 40 something billion dollars. So you really have had $150 billion or so of deployable CapEx. And I showed where that's gone. You know, there were some years, a couple of years, 2020, 2021, I think, where the Sherry purchases were north of $25 billion a year. Last year, they spent most of their deployable CapEx buying stocks in the market for the public common stock portfolio of the insurance operation. They did the same thing in 2018. That that growth capex is linear, but if you've got say thirty billion dollars a year of operating income of operating cash flows after depreciation expense to deploy, that's fifteen percent of the total, which will grow. I mean, your rate base continues to grow as you as you add assets to the system. It's just getting larger and larger, and it's earning kind of a regulated ten-ish return on invested capital. It's a it's a no brainer for five billion dollars is not chump change. And as long as as long as the opportunity set is is there from a tax standpoint and from an economic return standpoint, it's a great use of capital. But other utilities don't get to enjoy it. You have these publicly traded electrics that have dividend policies. Yeah. You're distributing two thirds of your profit as dividends, and even if you wanted to go spend the capex, the now you've got to go you've got to go raise new equity capital to to run it back up. Berkshire's not saddled with that. There is no dividend policy. The parent gets nothing from the energy. I mean, you want that being reinvested at, at what is a acceptable and predictable return. Yeah, imagine having a savings account with a 10% yield. <laughs> you just, you know, keep well, that's kind of how I look at Berkshire. If you buy the stock intelligently and the thing earns 10 and a half or 11 or 12 on equity, kind of depending on what the stock portfolio does over time, you know, how much better is that than buying a two-year treasury at 4%? I mean- yeah. Before we jumped on, Chris, uh, you said that you had taken a look at the Berkshire proxy. Do you want to let us know what you've gleaned from that? <laughs> well, you know, since I've gone to the annual meeting and you guys have gone a long time as well, we we're talking about that. Um, this is going to be, I don't know, I, I went for the first time in 2000. Every, the, the business part of the annual meeting, every year you've got these proxy proposals. Um, by various, you know, now ESG oriented, climate oriented groups that use Berkshire as a soapbox. Um, you've only got to own a share in two thousand dollars worth of a stock for three years or twenty five thousand for a single year to be to have a proxy initiative introduced onto a proxy statement. And Mr. Buffett gives those groups time at the annual meeting. I mean, last year's meeting was a little slow. Um, I think we got through three questions in the morning session. He's <laughs> He's determined yeah. to to speed up the speed up the annual meeting this year and field at least four questions in the morning it's like session. Like the, the pitch clock in the MLB. <laughs> yeah, but you've got Calpers and you've got the Quebec Canadian pension system. They're back with an identical proposal to last year that once Berkshire's parent 
the holding company and then each of its subsidiaries to file their own climate reports. And Berkshire's response is, I don't think you people even read our 10K, let alone, you know, the energy operation has publicly traded debt. And so I spend a bunch of time every year with the Qs and the Ks of Berkshire Hathaway Energy. And they've got, you know, deep disclosures on what they're doing on the carbon front and on greenhouse gas emissions. Greg Abel had a long section in the 2021 letter that addressed climate. But, you know, here these guys are again. I mean, you've got the the Quebec system. I mean, they invested in uh, failed crypto. They had investments in uh, SBF. Um, you know, maybe you ought to pay attention to your own investments <laughs> instead of kind of preaching to Berkshire how to run their affairs. And if you're yeah. CalPERS, good Lord, I mean, they managed to hire a card-carrying member of the CCP who took the hedge book off just as the stock market was melting down when the pandemic broke out. I mean, literally, I mean, look it up. Honest to God, card-carrying member of the CCP that they finally had to fire. Clean up your own house and quit using the Berkshire meeting as a proxy. The, you got the one lunatic, a lawyer that's got a little foundation that wants to separate the role of chairman and CEO. You know, I'm generally, and I'm sure you guys are as well, generally a fan of separation of that role. But this is Berkshire Hathaway. Warren Buffett still has 35 or 36% of the voting control of the company. It's his baby. Berkshire has already said when he's not running the show anymore, those roles will be separated. You'll have an independent director. But in the time being, you're going you're gonna to dare to tell Warren Buffett. So the, the guy that runs this proposal, you can look up his 990, his, his tax return, and he's got something like $25 million in, or two, take that back, $2.5 million in revenues of the foundation, gifts or grants per year. And they've got a whopping million dollars in investment assets. Well, this dude pays himself like two hundred fifty thousand dollar salary. Mm. And as far as I can tell, he is the chairman and the CEO of this thing. <laughs> oh, <the> irony. <laughs> I mean, so you know, it'll be interesting. I, I encourage anybody that either is at the meeting or listens in to hang around for the business meeting part because that's when Warren last year came out of his chair and really got animated because it pisses him off. I mean, governance, you won't find better governance at any company in the world better than you have it at Berkshire. I mean, you have the chairman uh, and the CEO and, and the vice chairman uh, making $100,000 salaries forever. They've never given away a single stock option or restricted share unit. Um, you, you don't abuse accounting. You don't have, you know... A, a, Right off, right down year after year after year, they did write down ten billion of precision, but you know that was a that was very much a one off. It's just it's it's as clean of a place as you can get. The charge of the board is to keep these lunatics away from Berkshire for as long as possible and allow the culture of the place to persist for as long as possible. It's really going to be interesting when he is gone, because these climate nut jobs and these ESG nut jobs are not going to go away. And they'll continue to come with full force and fury, and it's just maddening. I mean, it's, you know, it's the same proposal. It's like, it's like that. Did you guys go to the Chuck E. Cheese when you were kids? That whack a mole. Yeah. Well, it's like your rats. They keep coming at you. You know, every cycle they come at you. Every year they come at Berkshire, and you hammer them back down into the into the peg, and you know they crop up the next year with the same damn proposal. So I like when they because uh, they used to do the meet that part, the vote part earlier, like at the beginning of the meeting, and the crowd would just cheer when it would announce that it was voted down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, ho hopefully more stick around and cheer this year. Um, and, the, and these things have never never come close to being passed. And, yeah. you know, you, it, Berkshire's just got a, such a unique culture. You are, you, you do have so many individuals and families that own the shares yeah. that really think about governance through a proper lens rather than CalPERS dictating to you that you've got to fill out some checkbox form to make them all feel good and sing Kumbaya. It's just, I, I don't it, know if, I don't know if we're getting our hundred thousand dollars worth out of the guy at the top. I don't think he's working that hard every day. <laughs> well, he's got, he gets, he gets a, I mean, here we are talking about him. So, you know, he's getting some play. Um, I, I think the whole ESG thing has gone too far. The CFA Institute really got behind it. If you look at their website, it's all they talk about the 
the the CEO. It's all she tweets about. Um, and I think what happened on the on, on the you know when the war in Russia broke out last year and it really exposed the folly of Germany, for example, in their nuclear policy, closing all you know all but three of their nuclear plants post Fukushima. Uh, they wound up having to keep some open. They wound up having to reinvest in coal, um, yeah. and they really got lucky with a mild winter. Ditto in New England this year got very lucky with a mild winter. You got natural gas prices back down, but yeah, I think I think this I think. You know, as well intentioned as ESG is, this 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 formulaic prescription um, method of applying it is insane. I mean, you've got people assessing boards of directors for all the wrong reasons. I mean, you know, you ought to be sitting around thinking about capital allocation and ensuring you have the right management team in place, and not whether your board is being trained on properly on climate and ESG. Um, especially when you've got a place like Berkshire that's making such huge investments in renewable energy. I mean, unparalleled investments in renewables. You mean, you'd think that would suffice it for these crowd, but it doesn't, it, it's not sufficient for this crowd. It's just absolute insanity. Chris, we're, we're coming up on, on time. So it's probably not really fair to ask you this question now, but I'm going to do it anyway. <laughs> I, I track the 10 three, uh, inversion as a reasonable proxy for just what the shorter term looks like in the economy. I think it's been a reasonably good predict the reasonably good predictor of recessions before they occur. Not that not that uh, you need to follow those for any particular reason, but the ten three inversion as of today is as steep as it has ever been. So the data only goes back to nineteen eighty something like that. We're at like one point three eight today, and it's been inverted since October 25-ish last year. It's typically been a precursor to recession. Do you see having paying it? I think Berkshire is a pr pretty uh, broad slice of the global, of, of the global, but it, particularly the US economy. Do you, do you have any thoughts on? Keyhole into the US economy. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I would guess, yeah, we're probably, if we're not already in a recession, um, trending. I think we've probably been in one. Technically, I think you actually had two quarters in a row of the conventional definition, which is no longer the, the way it's definition. properly defined. Just move the you look at industry, every business we own, um, you know, things are just slower. Things are things are just slower. Um, our prior discussion on units uh, being very weak and down that that's not changing. Um, in my guess is, yeah, that it's probably been fairly predictive. Um, and you probably, it, it probably is telegraphing. Um, there, the feds, again, feds got a perfect record of um, popping bubbles and uh, blowing up the stock market and blowing up levered lenders and the borrow short lend long crowd. Um, and this last 25 basis point hike, now you've got our man Bullard here in St. Louis. You know, I think he's at five and but in five ace, 5.625 is now his longer term target. Again, the Volcker, I don't think Volcker needed to do what Volcker did. Inflation was already under control. And these guys think they need to be Volcker. Um, and I'm not suggesting we ought to jam rates back down to zero and run more QE uh, from here to eternity. But th that's where we're headed. You know, So they'll break something. And they're already breaking some things. They'll break a little bit more. Economy be very weak, and you'll be back at zero, and you'll be back at QE, and the Fed's balance sheet will blow through nine trillion dollars, and it'll wind up at eighteen trillion dollars. If you look at the Japanese central bank's balance sheet, we have a lot of room to layer on more and more QE, and I think that's what the market wants. You know, I think they like that monetary support and the free money, but it's just creating such enormous moral hazard that it's something we're all going to have to contend with. Um, here is is the leverage crisis, the the over levered system that we have resolves itself in some way, shape or form and shame on these people for allowing it to happen in the first place and not letting garden variety recession run its course. So, hmm. you know, with the volatility comes opportunity, but uh, I, I don't think it's going to be a lot of fun for a lot of people for the next 10 or 20 years. Um, I saw that there, that the little bit of tightening that they did in the last whatever six months or a year or something like trying to bring the balance sheet down like two-thirds of it was undone in like two weeks with just uh you know two I think it was over a weekend yeah over a weekend basically from a couple of very you know 
kind of inconsequential banks failing <laughs> all of a sudden. Well, we're just going to go back to to QE basically. Yeah, they're leaning on the discount window and accessing the home loan bank and you know, banks need capital. Um, but again, if it gets bad enough, you'll just suspend marked market accounting and we'll just backstop all deposits, all $18 trillion of bank deposits, which is insane. But it's real. Now, I, now I will say I've got clients who were terrified. Um, you know, they you, know, you run a business and you've got millions of dollars of payroll and you can't help but be in the banking system. And to try to manage FDIC minimums is insane. And so we had a bunch of money roll into a handful of our client accounts, which is really just cash, cash, where we're just buying T-bills on behalf of our client because they really were scared about having money in the banking system. I think what Schwab and all the brokers, we use Schwab heavily, but I think what the brokers all did in the financial crisis was criminal. I mean, criminal is hard, harsh, but you, know, you used to be able to sweep your cash either from deposits or dividends or security sales into a money market fund. Well, when rates were zero and money market funds had 50 basis point fees and you couldn't earn 50 basis points on cash instruments, they all said, oh, better off instead of subsidizing our money funds and you can't send a negative yield on cash to a customer. So they said, well, let's just create banks. And so they all now sweep to a bank. And so Schwab pays you whatever, half a percent on cash. And you know they're running a spread business and own a bunch of mortgages and half the portfolio is marked to market, half it's not marked to market. And they've created a lot of systemic risk there on the Schwab platform. The brokers have all done the same. I think Vanguard's the only one that doesn't sweep to uh, a bank now. I, I think Vanguard still sweeps to money funds, but you can go buy a money fund if you're on any of the broker dealer platforms, but you have to manually do it. We never leave FDIC balances, you know, north in to the extent any of our clients have cash. You know, even when interest rates were zero and we're getting five basis points on a T-bill, we'll take five basis points on the T-bill versus earning nothing in the Schwab bank. Why? I don't want the credit risk. I mean, why would you take the credit risk? I mean, you have no credit risk with the T-bill. You have a damn large amount of credit risk when you leave money into a bank sweep and you get a period like this where the Fed's jacked up rates by 500 basis points. A lot of people learning some lessons that have been around for a long some time. Some old lessons. <laughs> yeah. Chris, thanks so much for joining us. Hope you'll come back again soon and do it again. It was, uh, was, was great to learn from you. Well, it's always fun to be with you guys and we'll... Uh, We'll uh, uh, get together in Omaha in a couple of weeks. If you Sounds wait. good.